high level, what is GPT for? How does it work? And uh, what do you use most amazing about it? It's a system that we'll look back at and say it was a very early AI. And it will. it's slow, it's buggy, it doesn't do a lot of things very well, um, but neither did the very earliest computers. And they still pointed a path to something that was going to be really important in our lives, even though it took a few decades to evolve. Do you think this is a pivotal moment? Like uh, out of all the versions of GPT 50 years from now, when they look back at an early system yeah. that was really kind of a leap, you know, in, in a Wikipedia page about the history of artificial intelligence, which which of the GPTs would they put? That is a good question. I sort of think of progress as this continual exponential. It's not like we could say here was the moment where AI went from not happening to happening. And I'd have a very hard time like pinpointing a single thing. I think it's this very continual curve. Will the history books write about GPT-1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 7? That's for them to decide. I don't, I don't really know. I think if I had to pick some moment from what we've seen so far, I'd sort of pick ChatGPT. You know, it wasn't the underlying model that mattered. It was the usability of it, both the RLHF and the interface to it. What is ChatGPT? What is RLHF? Reinforcement learning with human feedback. What was that little magic ingredient to the dish that made it uh, so much more delicious? So we, we trained these models uh, on a lot of text data. And in that process, they, they learned the underlying something about the underlying representations of what's in here or in there. And they can do amazing things. But when you first play with that base model that we call it after you finish training, it can do very well on evals. It, it can pass tests. It can do a lot of, you know, there, there's knowledge in there. But it's not very useful, uh, or at least it's not easy to use, let's say. And RLHF is how we take some human feedback the simplest version of this is show two outputs, ask which one is better than the other, uh, which one the human raters prefer, and then feed that back into the model with reinforcement learning. And that process works remarkably well with, in my opinion, remarkably little data to make the model your, more useful. So RLHF is how we align the model to what humans want it to do. So there's a giant language model that's trained on a giant data set to create this kind of background wisdom knowledge that's contained within the internet. And then somehow adding a little bit of human guidance on top of it through this process makes it seem so much more awesome. Maybe just because it's much easier to use. It's much easier to get what you want. You get it right more often the first time and ease of use matters a lot, even if the base capability was there before. And like a feeling like it understood the question you were asking, or like it feels like you're kind of on the same page. It's trying to help you. It's the feeling of alignment. Yes. I mean, that could be a more technical term for it. And you're saying that not much data is required for that, not much human supervision is required for that. To be fair, we understand the science of this part at a much earlier stage than we do the science of creating these large pre-trained models in the first place, but yes, less data, much less data. That's so interesting. The science of human guidance. That's a very interesting science. And it's going to be a very important science to understand how to make it usable, how to make it wise, how to make it ethical, how to make it aligned in terms of all the kind of stuff we think about. Uh, and it matters which are the humans and what is the process of incorporating that human feedback and what are you asking the humans? Is it two things? Are you asking them to rank things? What aspects are you uh, letting the, or asking the humans to focus in on? It's, it's really fascinating. But uh, how, uh, what is the data set it's trained on? Can you kind of loosely speak to the enormity of this data set? The pre-training data set? The pre-training data set, I apologize. We spend a huge amount of effort pulling that together from many different sources. Um, there's like a lot of, there are open source databases of, of information. Uh, we get stuff via partnerships. There's things on the internet. Um, it's a lot of our work is building a great data set. How much of it is the memes subreddit? Not very much. Mm. Maybe it'd be more fun if it were more. <laughs> uh, so some of it is Reddit, some of it is news sources, all like a huge number of uh, newspapers. There's like the general web. There's a lot of content in the world, more than I think most people think. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, 
like too much. Like it, where like the task is not to find stuff, but to filter out stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. What is, is there a magic to that? Cause that seems, there seems to be several components to solve the, uh, the design of the, you could say algorithm. So like the architecture of the neural networks, maybe the size of the neural network. There's the selection of the data. There's the, the uh, human supervised aspect of it with, you know, uh, RL with human feedback. Yeah, I think one thing that is not that well understood about creation of this final product, like what it takes to make GPT-4, the version of it we actually ship out and that you get to use inside of ChatGPT, the number of pieces that have to all come together and then we have to figure out either new ideas or just execute existing ideas really well mm -hmm. at every stage of this pipeline. Um, there's quite a lot that goes into it. So there's a lot of problem solving. Like you've already said uh, for GPT-4 in, in, in the blog post and in general, there's already kind of a maturity that's happening on w some of these yeah. steps. Like being able to predict before doing the full training of well, how the model will behave. Isn't that so remarkable, by the way, yeah. that there's like, you know, there's like a law of science that lets you predict for these inputs, here's what's gonna come out the other end. Like here's the level of intelligence you can expect. Is it close to a science or is it still, because uh, <laughs> you said the word law and science, uh, <laughs> which are very ambitious terms. Close to, I said. <laughs> um, close to, right. I, <laughs> Let's be accurate, yes. I'll say it's way more scientific than I ever would have dared to imagine. So you can really know the uh, the peculiar characteristics of the fully trained system from just a little bit of training. You know, like any new branch of science, there's we're gonna discover new things that don't fit the data and have to come up with better explanations. And you know, that is the ongoing process of of discovery in science. But with what we know now, even what we had in that GPT-4 blog post, like I think we should all just like be in awe of how amazing it is that we can even predict to this current level. Yeah. You can look at a one year old baby and predict how it's going to do on the SATs. I don't know. Uh, seemingly an equivalent one, but because here we can actually in detail introspect various aspects of the system you can predict. That said, uh, just to jump around, you said the language model that is GPT-4, it learns in quotes something. <laughs> uh, in terms of science and art and so on, is there within OpenAI, within like folks like yourself and Elias Escaver and the engineers, a deeper and deeper understanding of what that something is, or is it still a kind of um, beautiful, magical mystery? Well, there's all these different evals that we could talk about, and what's an eval? Oh, like how we how we measure a model as we're training it, after we've trained it, and say like you know how good is this at some set of tasks? And also, just on a small tangent, thank you for sort of open sourcing the evaluation Evalu process. Yeah. yeah, I think that'll be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um. But the one that really matters is, you know, we pour all of this effort and money and time into this thing. And then what it comes out with, like how useful is that to people? How much delight does that bring people? How much does that help them create a much better world, new science, new products, new services, whatever. And that's the one that matters. And understanding for a particular set of inputs, like how much value and utility to provide to people. I think we are understanding that better. Um, do we understand everything about why the model does one thing and not one other thing? Certainly not, not always. But I would say we are pushing back like the fog of war more and more. And, and we are, you know, it took a lot of understanding to make GPT-4, for example. But I, I'm not even sure we can ever fully understand. Like you said, you would understand by asking a questions essentially, because it's compressing all of the web, <laughs> like a huge sloth of the web into a small number of parameters, into one organized black box that is human wisdom. What is that? Human knowledge, let's say. Human knowledge. It's a good difference. Is, is there a difference between knowledge so there's facts and there's wisdom. And I feel like GPT-4 can be also full of wisdom. What's the leap from facts well, to wisdom? You know, a funny thing about the way we're training these models is I suspect too much of the like processing power, for lack of a better word, is going into using the model as a database instead of using the model as a reasoning engine. Yeah. The thing that's really amazing about this system is that it 
for some definition of reasoning, and we could of course quibble about it, and there's plenty for which definitions this wouldn't be accurate, but for some definition, it can do some kind of reasoning. And you know, maybe like the scholars and, and the experts and like the armchair quarterbacks on Twitter would say, no, it can't, you're misusing the word, you're, you know, whatever, whatever. But I think most people have, who have used the system would say, okay, it's doing something in this direction. And, and I think that's remarkable and the thing that's most exciting. And somehow out of ingesting human knowledge, it's coming up with this reasoning capability, however we want to talk about that. Um, now, in some senses, I think that will be additive to human wisdom. And in some other senses, you can use GPT-4 for all kinds of things and say that it appears that there's no wisdom in here whatsoever. Yeah, at least in interactions with humans, it seems to possess wisdom, especially when there's a continuous interaction of multiple prompts. So I think what, uh, on the chat GPT site, it says, the dialogue format makes it possible for ChatGPT to answer follow-up questions, admit its mistakes, challenge incorrect premises, and reject inappropriate requests. But also, there's a feeling like it's struggling with ideas. Yeah, it's always tempting to anthropomorphize this st stuff too much, right, but I sure. also feel that way. 